By the way, what is your dream? To become first? Is it? No. To become a hero. When Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion was announced during the Final Fantasy VII 25th anniversary broadcast, it caught most people by surprise. I say most, as the announcement was leaked the day before, but in spite of the leak, there was still a significant amount of doubt that the game was being made. Part of this was because Square Enix themselves had been actively dismissing the very notion that they would even consider remastering Crisis Core. But there were also portions of the fanbase who were convinced it was impossible due to a. licensing issues relating to the game's theme song, Y, which was sung by Ayaka, b. licensing issues relating to Gact's likeness, and c. that its narrative could conflict with Remake and spoil big portions of the game for those who hadn't yet experienced Final Fantasy VII. The latter point was even used as a rationale by Tetsuya Nomura back in 2017, over three years before the Final Fantasy VII Remake even released. But here we are, almost six years on from when that statement was made, with Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion now very much a thing. And not only have Square Enix decided to go one step further than perhaps most people expected, creating what they're calling a true remaster as a way of resurfacing the story of its effervescent protagonist, Zack Fair, They've also made it an official part of the Final Fantasy VII Remake project to reflect its elevated importance. It means that even though the original PSP version of Crisis Core will be used as a base, many elements have been rebuilt from scratch. And throughout this review, we're going to discuss in some detail whether this has ended up being a good decision and one that's worthy of your time. As let's be honest, Square Enix doesn't always have the best of reputations when it comes to treating older properties with the care they often deserve. A few disclaimers before we start however. A PlayStation 5 copy of Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion was provided to us for free ahead of its launch for the purposes of conducting this review. Perhaps because we're glutton for punishment, we also played through the game on hard in order to really test out the gameplay and see how it holds up. It also needs to be said that all of the opinions you're about to hear are ours. No one at Square Enix had any input over anything we've said throughout this video. It should also be noted that due to this being a review of a game that was released 15 years ago, spoiler territory is a bit grey. In spite of that, we're aware that people who have never played Crisis Core will be watching this review, so we will not delve into specifics relating to the story, and we will ensure that the majority of footage is there for demonstrative purposes and will be taken from earlier parts of the game. We will, however, be talking in much more detail about the new mechanics and how the game has been modernised for a new generation of gamers. For that reason, our review will be broken down and prioritised into the following segments. 1. Gameplay 2. Presentation, which will have a light touch point on the story. Structure, before then rounding out with our final thoughts. So, strap yourselves in for our review of Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion. One of the more curious elements about Crisis Core when it was released back in 2007 was its gameplay. The battle system was overseen by a veteran of the Final Fantasy series called Takatsuka Nakazawa, Prior to working on Crisis Core as the battle planning director, Nakazawa had supported on the creation of battle systems for Final Fantasy VII, VIII, and X before being promoted to battle planning director for Final Fantasy X II. And it was in this role that he was responsible for producing what many fans feel is one of the best interpretations of the ATB system in history. Crisis Core would still have a loose relationship with what was established in Final Fantasy X II, featuring hidden ATB elements, but this time it was much more orientated towards real-time combat, and it served as an early example of where Tetsuya Nomura, Yoshinori Kitaze, and Hajime Tabata felt the future of Final Fantasy should lie. It meant Zack Fair would be free to run around each combat instance, able to evade standard enemy attacks by being outside of their range, and any actions he performed, despite having a real-time input, could only be followed up on a specific cadence. In short, it was meant to be a battle system that was more pseudo-real-time as opposed to being one that was truly real-time. Perhaps because of its stop-start nature, for Crisis Core Reunion, the developers decided to go back to the drawing board. This time, the battle system has been overseen by Katsuya Emi from Toze, and much like how the Final Fantasy VII Remake took elements of the original Final Fantasy VII battle system and seamlessly modernised them in a respectful manner, the same approach has been taken with what's ultimately a brand new combat system that has been designed from scratch. 
There are of course the same building blocks however. This means that Zack can still use the same equipment and material as he could within the original game, but how elements now function and influence the actions Zack can take within each combat instance is almost unrecognisable in comparison to the original game. One of the fundamental changes relates to attacking and defending. In the original game, even though guard and dodge were assigned to individual face buttons, they would require AP to perform, those costs no longer exist. The player would also need to use the shoulder button to cycle through a list of commands that could be performed, one of which was attack. This command based system was also how players would use their materia and use items, and it's that system that has seen a huge overhaul. Attack is now mapped to a specific face button, with it possible to perform free flowing combinations, and materia based commands such as casting spells and performing abilities are accessible via the new shortcut menu. It's also possible to combine attacks with abilities to enhance their damage. For example, if you perform a 3 to 4 hit combination using Zack's standard attack and then end up the combination by using the Assault Twister ability, the damage output of the ability will be greatly enhanced. Zack is also able to move around combat in a more fluid manner, and when combined with mechanics that have been retained from the original game, such as the ability to deal critical strikes from behind, it means combat within Crisis Core Reunion represents a considerable upgrade that also remains faithful. In this regard, it cannot be overstated how much of a good job the development team has done here. Remnants of the original Crisis Core battle system are still at the very core of the new battle system featured in Crisis Core Reunion, but those remnants, such as the shoulder buttons now being applied to selecting and using items instead of commands, have been made much more dynamic. And what's also very smart and impressive is that elements from the Final Fantasy VII Remake, such as the aforementioned shortcut system, have also been implemented in subtle and effective ways. The only area that did feel a bit superfluous in this regard is the new Battle Stance mode. This combat mechanic was not featured within the original Crisis Core, and within Crisis Core Reunion it could be unlocked after Zack Fair acquires the Buster Sword. Just like Punisher mode, which could be used by Cloud Strife within the Final Fantasy VII Remake, it allows Zack Fair to enter into a more aggressive combat stance, making him capable of dealing more damage from standard attacks and abilities. It's a neat crossover, but using battle stance requires the use of AP, and Zack is also rendered unable to move. It means that unlike almost every other aspect of the new combat system, its implementation feels a tad cumbersome, especially when compared to how it appeared within the Final Fantasy VII Remake. However, even though it does feel a tad cumbersome, with proper placement and strategic usage, it does complement the other mechanics and can be used to great effect in order to end encounters with a high degree of swiftness. The other big gameplay innovation present within the original Crisis Core was the DMW system. This was introduced to provide an element of luck, something the developers hoped would keep players engaged, reducing the chance for monotony. It also helped to connect gameplay with the overarching narrative as Zack's emotional state would help to determine what kind of bonuses the DMW system would provide within each combat encounter. Due to how integral it was within the original game, the developers of Crisis Core Reunion had to ensure that any changes they made didn't detract from that original objective, and it's perhaps for that reason that they only chose to make slight tweaks. Those tweaks do make quite a noticeable difference however, not in terms of how the DMW system works per se, but more in terms of how it interacts with the combat system as a whole. Zack will still spend SP automatically to have the DMW system run, and it still contains the same limit breaks, summons and status bonuses, while also being used to level up Materia and Zack. But now, everything is a lot more subtle. Players can choose when they want to use limit breaks and summons, and the various bonuses it brings are a lot less intrusive. The storing of DMW sequences then dovetails nicely with the boss abilities now being interruptible. It's a change that helps to add a degree of urgency, while also introducing a layer of strategy that wasn't present within the original game. The various limit breaks and summon sequences are also skippable now, which is perfect for those who don't want to be disconnected from the action, but even though those changes are positive, it does feel as though some of the original essence has been lost. With so much focus now placed on making combat as fast paced and action packed as possible, it's all too easy to pay almost no attention to what's actually happening with the DMW system, and it feels as though this could have been softened ever so slightly to make some things mandatory, especially sequences that are being seen for the first time. One last change, which may sound minor in the grand scheme of things, but makes a huge difference, is the camera. Within the original game, even though the camera could be adjusted, it was very arduous due to there being only one analog stick. With modern consoles not having the same deficiency, players are able to control the camera with a huge degree of freedom, and it makes navigating the field map much more enjoyable. 
The only nitpicks throughout all of this are that sometimes, after watching a DMW sequence, the camera may end up in an opposition, and sometimes, especially when playing on hard, you'll die just because you got a bit unlucky with the DMW system. But that the upgraded combat system critiques boil down to a small points of preference and nitpicks only serve as a testament to the fantastic job the developers have done. They have modernised what was offered within the original, creating a solid battle system that, even if it's not up there with the best in class action games on the market right now, feels by no means out of place amongst the current video gaming landscape. With Square Enix making such significant changes to how Crisis Core Reunion plays in comparison to the original, it's no surprise that they've also made significant changes to how it looks and sounds. It would have been easy for Square Enix to just upscale assets from the original game, but for Crisis Core Reunion, there have been almost no shortcuts in this regard. It means the game features brand new character models across the board, with characters from the original Final Fantasy VII made to look like their Final Fantasy VII Remake counterparts, and characters unique to Crisis Core also given the same treatment. Lesser NPCs have also been touched up in a noticeable way, but they do still have the same problem of reusing identical models far too often. But with the various environments also given a considerable enhancement, it all helps to bridge the gap between Crisis Core Reunion and the Final Fantasy VII Remake. That's not to say the quality is all that closely comparable though, Final Fantasy VII Remake features far superior visuals and environments, but they aren't poles apart. And it means that even though the various in-game cutscenes still, for the most part, use animations that are almost identical to the original game, it doesn't detract from the experience in any meaningful way. With that being said, there are still some quirks or hang-ups from the original game where characters will perform over-the-top physical reactions to things that have been said, kind of like you'd expect from a sim. It's something that would have made more sense in the original game where voice acting wasn't present as it would help to convey how the line was meant to be delivered and then received, but with every line now being voiced, it kind of feels odd and out of place. On that note, the FMVs suffer from a similar fate, albeit for a different reason. Square Enix has tried their best to upscale the various FMVs that featured in the original game, but there are noticeable artefacts, and it can be a bit jarring going from in-game cutscenes which are clinically clean and super high resolution over to the FMV sequences which are noticeably upscaled. Given that they were able to change one specific sequence to modify the appearance of the Buster Sword, it's clear they had the assets available to ensure that this didn't happen, so it's kind of disappointing. The other two major areas where presentation has been improved are both related to audio voice acting, and music. To ensure consistency with the Final Fantasy VII Remake, Square Enix has chosen to bring over the new voice cast. That means characters like Cloud, Sephiroth, Aerith, and Tifa all have the same voice actors as they had in the Final Fantasy VII Remake, and any characters that are yet to feature in the game were recast. For the most part, this is a solid change, not too surprising given how well received the new voice cast was when the Final Fantasy VII Remake released. But there is, unfortunately, one noticeable exception here. As part of the reshuffle, Zack Fair was also recast, with Caleb Pierce now taking up the role. There was some consternation around how the few lines he had within the Final Fantasy VII Remake were delivered, and many were hoping improvements would be made for Crisis Core Reunion. For the most part, those improvements are there. Caleb Pierce does a decent enough job, but for a project of this nature, doing a decent job doesn't feel good enough. Eerily, it kind of feels similar to Final Fantasy Type 0 HD. That game featured some very strong sequences, sequences that were supported by top-notch voice acting. But there were also some iffy moments, moments where you couldn't help but notice the voice acting, and not for the right reasons. In spite of that, the entire game being voiced is a pretty solid enhancement, and this level of effort should be commended, even if sometimes it's kind of let down by them sticking a bit too closely to the original script. The other area that's been enhanced is the music. To confess, whenever Square Enix announces they're rearranging one of their classic soundtracks, there's always a slight feeling of dread. Those original sounds often hold a special place in the hearts of many, and there have unfortunately been some real disasters over the years where pieces have been rearranged and just lost their magic. This can be the case whether the original composer has returned to redo their own work or some new blood has been hired to take a crack. In the case of Crisis Core Reunion, it's that first instance, as Takahara Ishimoto has been commissioned to rearrange his own original soundtrack. And for the most part, he's done a good job. Many of the rearrangements are faithful to the original, and they don't detract from the experience, which is the most important thing. Now, with presentation rounded out, it brings us on to structure. 
This is one aspect that could make or break Crisis Core Reunion depending on your tolerance levels, as it's pretty much unchanged in comparison to the original. Given the game was designed to be enjoyed in bite-sized chunks, that could be seen as a good thing or a bad thing depending on how you look at it. It means the story-related segments are quite broken up, with only one or two encounters per area before moving on, and there's an absolute boatload of missions, each of which will only take one or two minutes to complete. 15 years ago, there was a lot more tolerance for this, especially as these design philosophies were in place partly due to the portable nature of the device and partly due to its hardware limitations. But with those limitations no longer there, it can make the world feel much smaller than it is, with the flow of the game often broken up due to endless loading scenes, something made more noticeable due to Zack's ability to now run around the field. The only saving grace is that the loading scenes are now considerably quicker than they were on the classic PSP 1000. Missions themselves aren't too dissimilar from the way the Shimmer Combat Simulator was used within the 7 remake, and that relates to both its application and the substance of the missions themselves. The only difference is that there are many, many times more, and there isn't a huge amount of variety. Crisis Core Reunion also features a ton of side quests. Again, these have been left untouched, so that could either be a good thing or a bad thing depending on how much you enjoy using guides, as due to how they were implemented, it's unlikely you'll be able to complete them all on your own, and you may not even realise that some exist. It should be said though, that they aren't all that taxing, and they reward players with some fun fan service, so they're well worth the investment. In conclusion, given Square Enix has a pretty bad reputation when it comes to their remasters, with there being some huge missteps over the years, it's pleasing to say that Crisis Core Reunion does not fall into the same trap. That's not to say it's perfect, and in spite of how much they've invested, there are still noticeable shortcuts. But with Crisis Core Reunion acting as a pseudo-remake, it enhances and rebuilds positive aspects of the original, doing a much better job of transitioning from the PSP to home consoles than, say, Type-Zero did some six years ago. In short, Crisis Core Reunion feels like it's a must-have title for fans of Final Fantasy VII, and it's true whether you've played Crisis Core on the PSP or come into the franchise more recently with Final Fantasy XV or the VII Remake. The only caveat of note is that it's difficult to say whether there's enough here to win over those who didn't get on with the original version of Crisis Core. But either way, Square Enix, at a minimum, should be commended for how much effort they've placed on attempting to bring Crisis Core into the modern era. Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening to this review of Crisis Core Reunion. We hope you found it useful. I still vividly remember playing through Crisis Core on my commute to work, and playing through Crisis Core Reunion was a serious blast from the past, just as I'm sure it will be for many of you too. If, of course, you're thinking about getting the game. And on that note, we'd love to hear in the comments below whether you are thinking about getting the game, and if you are, which aspect of it are you most looking forward to? Alright, with that, this is Daryl signing out. As always, I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Galsian de Kujata, Gregory and Lord of Morning, who are super special Onionite supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.